On October 15, 1969, the president of a newly established state of Somalia, Abdul Rashid Ali Shalmarke, took a trip up north to the city of Las Hanod for an official visit. Inside of a guest house, in a remote northern outpost, there would be an event that would change the landscape of Somali history and cause a complete overhaul of the current political system. Shot dead by his bodyguard with an automatic rifle, a mere six days later, on October 21st, a seismic shift echoed through the nation as the military and police forces proclaimed the end of the civilian regime, heralding the dawn of a revolutionary era. The Supreme Revolutionary Council, otherwise known as the SRC, was the governmental body that was created after the coup. The charming man at the helm of the organization, General Siad Barre, addressed the nation by saying, In our revolution, we believe that we have broken the chain of a consumer economy based on imports, and we are free to decide our destiny. And in order to realize the interests of the Somali people, their achievement of a better life, the full development of their potentialities, and the fulfillment of their aspirations, we solemnly declare Somalia to be a socialist state. This marked the beginning of the Somali socialist experiment, a period of time that lasted until the collapse of the government into a brutal civil war in 1991. Hello everyone, in today's video I will be exploring a topic and a period of time that has led to varying accounts in almost every Somali household, mine included. This is completely warranted, as the effects that the regime had are still visible today. Many attribute the negative afflictions of Somali society to President Barre, while on the other side, many Somali people revere the man for the way he guided the nation through a post-colonial struggle. In any case, I am going to give it my best shot in providing an in-depth review into his policies and how the nation changed under his leadership, going through the good, the bad, and the very ugly. But before we could do that, let us take a quick recap into the years leading up to the coup so we can have a better picture into the stage this movement walked into. There were many accusations leveled at the Shalmarki regime when the SRC gave their speech to the nation and the global community. Such concerns were the exploitation of national institutions, mounting external dependencies, and a fracturing social fabric. And they weren't exactly wrong. The unification of the two regions that created what we see in modern day Somalia British Somaliland and Italian Somaliland, were under an intense political battle for representation. Hargeisa, a major city in the north, was not chosen as the nation's capital, but instead Mogadishu. The SYL, otherwise known as the Somali Youth League, the political government in power, did not include proportionate northern representation, which only added to the political tensions. The hostility reached the boiling point when there were rebellions in major northern towns. In Ahmed Ismail Samatala's book, Socialist Somalia, Rhetoric and Reality, a great read that I will make constant reference to, he proposes that the mounting pressures and dissatisfactions within the northern regions of Somalia was a result of class conflict. He argues that the petite bourgeoisie competed and vied for key roles in the newly established state structures. It was no surprise then that the coalition government failed and many new parties were formed to try to exploit the situation and draw support. Among those, you had the GSL, who was known as the Greater Somalia League, which was the most radical of the pre-independence parties in the South, by the way, undergo a restructuring, transforming it into the Somali Democratic Union, otherwise known as the SDU. The SDU's policies included immediate confiscation of all fertile agricultural lands, especially those conceded to and still owned by Italians the distribution of a portion of such land to impoverished Somali peasants, establishment of collective farms for the people, nationalization of major economic sectors, state responsibility for social services, including unemployment compensation, housing and burial sites and expenses, and the commitment to eliminate tribalism. This just goes to show that there were movements that adopted socialist ideology before the Siad Bari regime. Putting aside the crazy political landscape for a moment, let us look at the economy during those years. The Shamarki regime adopted liberal policies to attract foreign private investment. These policies included, but were not limited to, a free transfer of the original investment after five years, no restrictions on the employment of foreign technical personnel, a tax exemption for 10 years, as well as being permitted to transfer up to 50% of the income abroad, among other lucrative opportunities. 
While these policies were seen as beneficial to stimulate economic growth by encouraging investment, they also raised questions about the potential impact on local employment, income distribution, and government revenues. The Hussein government in Somalia was formed after the SYL's electoral victory in 1963 and 1964. Abdirazak Haji Hussein became prime minister in 1964, leading to a political crisis within the SYL due to his non-traditional cabinet selections. Intra-party disagreements arose over issues of pan-Somalism and clan balance. But despite initial cabinet rejection, Hussein was re-nominated and eventually gained approval with modifications. He served until the 1967 presidential elections, which highlighted a divide between moderation and militancy and pan-Somalism. This would mark a shift in Somalia's political direction. The Iqal government, starting in 1967, prioritized internal development over external confrontations in Somalia. Prime Minister Iqal's moderate approach on pan-Somali issues led to improved relations with Ethiopia and Kenya. The March 1969 elections, dominated by the Somali Youth League, faced allegations of election rigging and corruption, leading to discontent among intellectuals, the military, and the police. The military, traditionally outside politics, became dissatisfied, contributing to a broader sense of frustration within the society. This instability was the perfect storm that the armed forces needed to take over. The first 48 hours saw the detention of the civilian leaders, the closure of the National Assembly, and a charter that was unveiled to the public concerning the internal and external policy of the military junta. The military faction that toppled the democratic regime later characterized its intervention as a Marxist revolution, not only establishing a new political structure, but also advocating for the comprehensive transformation of Somali society through the implementation of what the government termed scientific socialism. Scientific socialism is a Marxist idea that promotes a systematic approach to transforming a society from capitalism to socialism emphasizing the need to abolish private property and establish state control over production, which is a huge proponent in leading ultimately to a classless society. A quote that perfectly encapsulates this concept comes from none other than Kwame Nkrumah, former president of Ghana, who was a Marxist and Pan-Africanist. He states that it is essential that socialism should include overriding regard to the experience and the consciousness of a people, for if it does not do so, it will be serving an idea and not a people it will generate a contradiction. It will become dogmatic. It will shed its materialist and realist basis. It will become fanaticism, an obscurantism, an alienator of human happiness. The SRC focused on systematically reorganizing the nation's political and legal institutions. It developed a guiding ideology drawing from both the Quran and Marxist principles. They removed civilian officials who were not open to their ideology and re-education. The influence of clans, an integral part to the social fabric of Somali society, was aimed at being removed entirely. He addressed tribalism as a disease and said it would block efforts in development. He tried to disrupt this by resettling nomadic pastoralists in areas far from their own lands so they could take part in sedentary agriculture. Sedentary agriculture is a method of agriculture in which the same land is farmed every year. By keeping the nomadic Somalis in diverse areas, they can be less isolated with their tribe and reduce clan solidarity. They can also obtain more consistent living conditions. Siad Beroy's regime has seen the ownership of the Italian Somali sugar industry, the nationalization of the Italo Somali Electric Society, oil distributing companies, foreign banks, and the creation of a national insurance company. There was less of an emphasis to bring in imports and an increase in food production for local consumption. They created the Agricultural Development Agency, otherwise known as the ADA, to organize the distribution of commodities at regulated prices. Other notable government initiatives included salary reductions of up to 40% for senior bureaucrats, 20% cuts in rent, and an increase in taxation on buildings and luxury items. The early to mid-1970s saw a developmental plan in the rural sector. The government encouraged the formation of communal farms where land and resources were collectively owned and managed by communities, the government initiated the nationalization of land, aiming to abolish private ownership and establish state control over agricultural resources. Farmers were encouraged to join in cooperatives for collective decision-making and resource sharing. The government invested in rural infrastructure development, including the construction of roads, irrigation systems, and storage facilities. The society that Siad Bari wanted to establish was met with numerous criticisms. For one, the SRC was split among three factions a left-leaning contingent advocating for a more radical transformation with socialist inclinations, 
a robust nationalist center, and a right-wing group that favored preserving a colonial setup. This rift in government unity was also met with resistance with Islamist groups. Efforts to enhance the position of Somali women in society were met with scrutiny. Siad Barre asserted that reforms advocated by the SRC in this regard aligned with an evolving interpretation of Islamic principles. However, opposition from traditionalists was still strong. This boiled over in his Family Act of 1974, which outlined an age of consent to marriage, prohibition of polygamy, and the nature of marriage ceremonies. The Wadads, also known as the Somali Ulema, responded with strong condemnation, accusing the regime of intruding into the spiritual and theological domains that traditionally governed Somali life. They asserted that such interference not only showed disregard for the enduring traditions rooted in Islam, but also indicated the encroachment of secularism and bureaucratic intrusion. But it was quick to control the narrative, however, and in the process executed 10 theologians for their counter-revolutionary activities. Siad also had two generals of the SRC executed for what many believed to be a struggle for power and attempts on his life. A key goal of the revolutionary government was to establish a standardized orthography for writing the Somali language, intending to designate it as the official language of the country. The two colonial languages, English and Italian, both were used in administrative work. You also had Arabic, which was used in Islamic schools and courts, and this complicated procedure of passing records in many languages was seen as inefficient. Siad Bari wanted to instill nationalism in the Somali people, and to promote this, the native tongue had to be used in professional settings. The Somali people, historically organized in pastoral and nomadic societies, had a rich oral culture that encompassed storytelling, poetry, proverbs, and other forms of verbal expression. There was an effort decades earlier in the 1920s to create a Somali script. Osman Yusuf Kennedy managed to create an indigenous script, which was called Osmania. However, colonial suppression prevented it from spreading to the people. Suffice to say, Latin was chosen to be the new orthodox orthography for the official administrative and national language. This had mixed reactions from the Somali people. Uh, notice a trend here, this is definitely a recurring theme. You had one camp of the Somali people favor the decision since it made seeking higher education outside the country easier. But you also had questions from many Somalis whether it is acceptable to have a Christian script be the new orthographic means of a Muslim nation. Nevertheless, the Cultural Revolution was carried out in three-month durations that saw as many as 20,000 teachers recruited from the government to assist in the campaign. The goal was to make the entire population literate in only two years, and the project quickly showed that that was an impossible goal. The slow start was because of the unpredictable movement of the nomadic people, a lack of teachers alongside materials, and an unclear management of the language to be made the mode of instruction. Despite all the hurdles, the literacy rate jumped from a measly 6 to 7% to 60% over the course of a decade. It is important to note that through the 70s in Siad Bare's first decade in power, the Soviet Union was by far his closest ally. The Soviet Union advised Bare that he should transition to a civilian-led government, and in 1976, the SRC was dissolved and the Somali Revolutionary Socialist Party, otherwise known as the SRSP, was established. While this may appear to be a move towards the end of the military regime and the restart of the civilian system, the SRC was voted to be the central committee of the new party, which had military officers alongside civilians. It was clear to see that this was done to provide a window for Siad Bari to still consolidate power and maintain control. The SRSP gave birth to the Federation of Somali Trade Unions, the Somali Revolutionary Youth Organization, and the Somali Women's Democratic Organization, the final one marketing a pivotal advancement for Somali women in their enduring quest to break free from the constraints of patriarchal control and the traditional norms of submission and silence. The foreign policy during this time saw plenty of action as well. The collective self-reliance and anti-imperialism saw relations with North Korea, Cuba, national liberation movements, and newly independent states. Somalia supported the Mozambique Liberation Front, uh, which was named Frelimo, in his struggle against Portuguese colonial rule, supported the liberation movements in Rhodesia, now Zimbabwe, against the minority white-led regime of Ian Smith, and sent assistance to the African National Congress, the ANC, in South Africa, which was fighting against apartheid. However, only one conflict is at the heart and mind of many Somalis, and that is the Ogaden War of 1977 with the Western Somali Liberation Front. 
The Ogaden region is a location in eastern modern-day Ethiopia that Somalis lived in historically and still do have a majority footprint in. Siad Bare and many pan-Somali civilians have laid claim to that land and have had a desire to annex the land into Somali rule. Obviously, this wasn't going to fan well with the Ethiopians, and there was really no way to negotiate such things. You did have the Soviets who tried to solve the issue in the most tame way possible, which was, and wait for this, to unite the two nations who have had beef since the 14th century alongside Djibouti and the nation of Yemen across the Gulf of Aden into one nation. Yeah, maybe we should have checked those cigars that Fidel Castro was smoking. <laughs> the Soviet Union was quick to focus their funds to Ethiopia since the Americans left a power vacuum there, and Somalia used that opportunity to appeal to the US to get military assistance for their upcoming invasion. Jimmy Carter, the President of the United States at the time, declined, but that didn't stop the Somalis from entering the region and making serious advances. The Soviets sent some 15,000 Cuban troops to Ethiopia to combat the offensive. Siad Bara did not take the betrayal from his allies well, who viewed him as an aggressive military dictator and threatened them in speeches during the war. After around 8 months of battle, the Ethiopians came out on top, and this event saw the end of the Soviet influence in the nation. The morale of the nation, a year ago united in their goal of liberating the Ogaden region, now was in freefall after a brutal war which saw heavy losses, an end in diplomatic relations, and increasing debt. The alliance that the tribes had among each other started to wane, and an environment of mistrust took its place. This gave rise to rebellion groups with the goal of outing Siad Bare from rule. The Somali Salvation Front, otherwise known as the SSF, a group that is centered around the Major Ten clan, whose headquarters were in Ethiopia, started to grow rapidly. The group united with other groups to form the Democratic Front for the Salvation of Somalia. But it was quick to try to suppress the movements, and went as far as to assert collective punishment to the clans and people involved. This was done to the tribes of Major Ten, Isap, and Hawiya. The Hawiya and Major Ten clans saw killings of thousands of people from the Red Barrets in the cities of Galkayo, Garaway, and Mogadishu. The Isap clan specifically suffered the most from the hands of Bare's authoritarian regime and armed militias. The Somali National Movement, otherwise known as the SNM, was the biggest threat after the area declared itself to be an independent Republic of Somaliland. The goal of the movement was to liberate itself from the Bare administration and restore the British Somaliland borders into their control. Through the years of 1988 to 1991, there was a state-sponsored campaign to bomb the cities of Hargeisa and Burao in the north, and the carnage saw nearly 400,000 Somalis displaced and around 50 to 100,000 people dead. The cities were pretty much leveled in Bare's attempt to beat the Sakh into submission. It all came to an end when the United Somali Congress, otherwise known as the USC, finally ousting Siad Bare from power with dissidents from all other factions opposed to the administration. The civil war and Bare's toppling opened up a power vacuum that saw a fight over leadership and territory. The transitional federal government was established in the early 2000s, and this led to another civil war over Islamist groups associated with Al-Qaeda. Somalia today is still in a recovery period after a somewhat successful campaign to drive out Shabab from southern Somalia and Mogadishu. When looking at the legacy of Siad Bari, it is clear to see that what lies in his memory are the brutal acts of chaos and warfare that have been committed in his last decade of power. It is easy to decipher the malicious intent for him to retain control, and to see him go to such lengths to hold a breaking nation together can only be described as sheer horror. There is no other way around that fact. The man has done actions on the tail end of his political career that must be condemned, and I will rightfully partake in that condemnation. However, what is also clear to see is that the man did not follow parts of his ideology. He claimed to get rid of Somali tribalism that had family members and people of his clan in his political governance. He promised that he would give the people a democratic system where they can collectively create change, but he made it so that he would have a final say in policy. He said that he would promote a secular society, but he had numerous human rights abuses. His authoritarianism was serious, but so were his threats. Looking into the circumstances of the nation, Siad had to worry about Ethiopian influence, a religious group that was willing to rebel against his secularism. 
clan groups and leaders that were looking to fight his opposition to tribalism. The second half of his political rule was vastly different to the first. He has taken great strides for his people, and up until the Ogaden War, I would wager that the nation generally approved of his leadership. To still blame him three decades after his death also shows the lack of leadership ever since he left, and the unwillingness by the people to settle their differences for the greater good. Did Ali Mahdi, Abdullah Yusuf, Hassan Sheikh Mohammed do more for the Somali people than Siad Barre? I don't think so. It also pains me to see the stagnation of Somalia when Rwanda, a nation that went through a genocide where half a million Tutsis were murdered, develop and prosper today into one of the fastest growing nations in Africa. I am not going to be a Siad apologist. I see the good that he has done and I will praise it accordingly, alongside the atrocities and be critical of his actions. I think more nuance is needed for these conversations and hopefully we can create a healthy environment where we can heal from the past and move towards a brighter future. I believe that a brighter future is an implementation of socialism, one where all Somalis are taken care of in society, regardless of their tribe and their story. One where we can take up the work we can do towards the betterment of our Somali brothers and sisters, from each according to his ability to each according to his needs. That is the socialism model, and only then can we make giant leaps towards the creative spaces we made during the 70s. Thank you for listening.